It is a joy to be with you. Thank you, Doug, for your kindness. I don't know who let the rumor get out that Steve Baggett and I were friends. That is, uh, this is a terrible rumor. I, well, I'll try not to speak too disparaging against it. I love Steve Baggett. If you know the Baggett family, if you know their good work and their good name, you know that they're worthy of being loved. They're great people. The Walnut Street Church family is a great family of God's people. We're blessed to know them and to love them. We have been blessed by God's people wherever we have been in our lives, and it's a great joy to be able to share the day with you, to be blessed by you. This is our, our first occasion to be with the brethren here in White Bluff, and we're excited for that, honored by the opportunity. We rolled in, maybe you saw the white van screech into the parking lot. We rolled in on two wheels. We preached this morning at Walnut Street at their 7 o'clock service and their 9 o'clock service. We thought, well, if we... If we time it just right, we'll get over here uh, just in time. And so I'm, I'm thankful for your grace that you extended to us to be able to do that, be able to be with them, and then to come and be with you. I want you to know us, not for the sake of, of saying that we're anything to know, but just so there's familiarity, so that you know the guy in front of you is really no different from from you. Now, I know probably your wife is not this pretty, but that's all right. I'm sure she's a good lady. But here's the truth of the matter. God has richly blessed me in all of my days with my Mindy. She has been in every way God's richest blessing to me. Save His Son. Our family could not do anything that we do for the kingdom were it not for her. We wouldn't be able to work the work that we work because if she weren't our our help and our encourager, well, we just probably wouldn't be doing much of anything useful. She's the one that, that makes sure that we're all where we need to be doing what we need to be doing when we're supposed to be doing it. Because of that, we're blessed. If you've got a chance to meet her or me today, well, I think the choice is obvious. Meet her. You'll be the better for it. She and I will celebrate our 22nd wedding anniversary this coming June, and God has just granted us wonderful time, and I pray for many, many more years together. Let me tell you about our kiddos, take you around the horn and show you who we have here. We have Connor, the old man. He's our firstborn. We call him the old man. He's 17. He's going on 81. He doesn't get in a hurry for anything. It just takes his time, and that's fine. It drives me nuts, but it's probably just right. We sent him to go get the van after Walnut Street worship, and I stood at the door, and I said, "How we sent the wrong one to get the van. You know that, right? I said, he's going to going to take forever. He drove us over here. Here's the thing. When you know you have to be somewhere to preach, but you know you might be sinning if you speed to get there, let your son drive. That way you'll just say, now look, don't go fast, right? That's the way, that's the way you negotiate those things. That's how you get around that. He is an excellent firstborn. He is a tremendous son. We're getting rid of him in the fall, <laughs> sending him off to school. He'll be a freshman at Freed Hardeman coming this fall. See, his senior year is upon him, and we are glad for that at Dixon County, and he has been a blessing to our family, and we're excited for what the Lord has in store for him in his days ahead. Let me tell you about Kendall. You'll, you'll hear her before you see her. She's, she's the rowdy one of the bunch. Uh, she keeps us all on our toes. She's 14, and if she's not arguing a case in front of the Supreme Court one day, I'll be shocked, and it will just floor me. She is an absolute joy to our lives. At the top of that picture, you see Kenley. She is, uh, she is prominently perched in that picture, and I think it's probably a metaphor for just how she tends to, to rule just about everything and anything. She knows how to, to manipulate and get her way, but she also knows how to be kind and thoughtful and sweet. She is a, a good, good girl. There's Carson. He rounds out the bunch. Kenley is nine. Carson is five. He'll be six in March, and he is, well, he, he's he's... Fine in this picture. He's got some ice cream with him, so he's fine there. Carson came into the world a little uniquely, though. Came into the world not very pleased with much of anything in the world. I think he was most put out by the guy behind the camera, has stayed that way. But he's also kept that bottom lip with him throughout most of his days. He carries it with him wherever he goes, and it's just never really left. In fact, you take him to the happiest place on earth, you take him to the beach, he still finds that bottom lip. It just, it just finds its way out. He's not, he's not angry or anything. He's just, you know, he's not impressed yet. <laughs> he's, just, he's not overly impressed with much of anything around him. Here's my goal is that today when we have our, our time together in studying the Word, 
that you don't walk away in that regard, or at least you, you hear what we have to say and you take it for what it's worth, the Word and nothing more, nothing less. I want you to know that I firmly and wholeheartedly agree with what Doug had to say. We live in a world that seems to be turned upside down. We live in a world where husbands and wives wonder how do we reach our sons and daughters and how do we tell them the things that we know they need to know, but how do we tell them these things in such a way that equips them for going out into the world? How do we tell them these things in order that they can engage the world around them in a very meaningful way? Your shepherds, God bless them, ask that we discuss today concepts that have to do with the family, concepts that have to do with with our sexual identity, concepts that have to do with how we engage the world that seems to be totally oblivious to any of the truth that God has sent forth regarding these things. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 that those who are in Jesus Christ are complete, that is whole, they are fully put together in Him. But yet it seems like the world tells us you are not complete, you will not be complete, you can never be complete unless you are following the prescribed things that we offer to you. Unless you do the things that we want you to do or unless you believe the things that we want you to believe. The book cover that you see in front of you is a book entitled Loves God, Likes Girls. It's authored by a a woman the name Sally Gray. Sally writes about how she grew up in a very faithful household, religious household, a household not unlike the household that perhaps you and your loved ones grew up in. She writes about how during the weekends, those were the best times, how that Sundays were the very, very best days because those were seemingly the days that her dad did not go on tirades throughout the house. Through the week, however, it was not as pleasant as it seemed to be on Sundays. Through the week, she would talk about how her father would come home and he would come home in these fits of rage and these fits of anger. He would be very abusive, very oppressive, very cruel. And how that her mother would make apology and make excuse for her father. Now, Sally, you know that your dad doesn't mean these things. You know that your dad doesn't really believe these things. You know that that's not really the way your dad wants to behave. Sometimes it would be so bad for Sally that she would go and she would seek solitude. She would hide somewhere deep in the house, a closet, a corner behind a closet, if she could find it. She would sit and she would sing to herself, probably sing a familiar song that you've sung. Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the king someday. Sally writes about how she grew up and how she lived her life apart from God. How that she was so desirous, she was so wanting, she was so seeking, she was so hungry for acceptance, for some kind of connection to the world around her and to people, that she found one of the most welcoming and inviting in receptive communities within the homosexual and lesbian community. And so she began to identify with that community. She began to to act upon those desires of same-sex attraction. and She began to fulfill so much of what she had been looking for and what she had told herself was missing in her life until she realized that these things were only temporary and they were only momentary and that they were not really fulfilling the very thing that she desired to have fulfilled and escape from her loneliness. And it wasn't found in that lifestyle. There's another book title entitled, Gay Girl, Good God. From this book, I would read you an excerpt, read you some words of the author. The author's name is Jackie Hill Perry, and here's what she has to say. The same Bible that condemned me held in it the promises that God could save me. I just had to believe it. It being what it said about him, God. Jesus had the guilty in mind when he was hung high and stretched out wide. On it, 
He died in my place for my sin. He bare-bodied and face set on joy became as slaughtered lamb underneath the wrath of God. You would think his father would have had a better memory than that. Didn't he know that that wrath was mine? It even had my name on it. But he knew his justice wouldn't allow him to forget. His love is what he wanted me to know and remember. And I did. One of the challenges we face when in the church today, when in the world of Christianity today, is how we talk about and how we capture the conversation surrounding sexual identity. So oftentimes we are flooded today with the notion of the idea of identity on so many levels. We think about identity politics, and that's where individuals who can be white and who can be male and who can be native-born and who can be of advanced age will tell you that they identify with every division, subdivision, segment, and subsegment of society, and it's every subsegment of society for which they stand and for which they want to support and for which they identify and with whom they want to align. But truth of the matter is, it is the subdividing and the subsectioning of our culture that is not bringing us closer together as a people. In fact, it is driving us further apart from one another. It's harming us. It's destroying us. And the only place to find real, true, beautiful, harmonious unity is in the body of Christ, His church. Period. The nature of the world in which we live right now is too that when Christianity speaks about identity, particularly when Christianity speaks about sexual identity, Christianity is viewed in a way that sometimes people walk away and they ask the question, why is it that you Christians hate homosexuals so much? Why is it that you Christians hate gays and lesbians? Why is it that that seems to be the only thing you want to talk about? Sometimes those commentaries and criticisms are warranted. Sometimes they are accurate. Because sometimes the way that some of our language does speak of some of the issues relative to some members of this community is less than flattering. Can I tell you just as an aside that the Bible says that our speech should be what? Full of grace, seasoned with what? Salt. Can I tell you that that applies to those who are lost in sin, including those who are lost in sexual sin, including the kind of sexual sin that God calls aberrant and a reproach and an abomination? Can I tell you that the same kind of grace that is applied to the one who has cheated on his wife with another woman is the same kind of grace that applies to a man who is engaged in sexual activities with another man? Can I tell you that the same kind of grace seasoned with the same kind of salt is owed to a community that we would look at and say, I could never do that. They need the same kind of grace. And can I tell you that pejorative language, can I tell you that euphemistic statements, can I tell you that hurtful words spoken in derision is neither language that is full of grace or salt. So before you think a sin that God has condemned has now given you license somehow to make fun of it, Ridicule it or put it down. Think again. Maybe one of the reasons why we have earned a reputation for why we are viewed as people who hate a community is because of the way we've spoken of their sin. Different from ours? If you're not practicing it, yes. Yes. Its consequences are different, yes. Its ramifications in your life are different, yes. 
It's condemnation? No. Not different. Not at all. So be careful. I want you to think about how we look at sexuality. I want you to think about it through the lens of how we have arrived at a place in our world today where the notion of sexuality is, is so distorted. Here's the, here's the concept. A worldview has to be shaped of how you see the world around you. My concern is not necessarily that my family, my children, my sons and my daughters may grow up and, and live or choose to live this kind of lifestyle. That's not my primary concern. My primary concern is that my sons and daughters may look upon this lifestyle and step back and ask the question, I don't see what the problem is. Because it has been brought into a normative way of conversation. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, no, maybe. Does that make sense? That it's normalized as a worldview lifestyle. And that in and of itself brings me to a place where I fail to make the real connection with people who need to see the grace of God. My worldview matters. The Bible says, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on things of the Spirit, Romans 8 and verse 5. And so if I'm thinking about how I live in the world, my life and my view of the world needs to be driven by something more than just my flesh, nature of the world. I give consideration to how we measure things that we are told. John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. What? To see whether or not they are of God. Not everything you are told, not everything you are led to believe, not everything that is put in front of you is true. But yet we are in an age and we are in a society, we are in a time, we are in an era where individuals will chase through certain ideas and ideologies all because it's what they see in front of them. The promotion of big tech media among a society today has led us to subdivide ourselves into these rabbit holes of theories and thinking where we chase after this notion and that notion and it's reinforced in our life. It must be true. Why? Because I found it. It says it right here. And we go further and further and further into that way of thinking. And we have yet to really filter anything through the Word of God, the timeless standard by which all mankind will be judged. You have that which will judge you in the last day, Jesus said. The words that I have spoken to you, this will judge you. So do we measure the things of the world around us? It's completely different. Do we measure the things of the world around us by the world standard or by God's standard. Do you know when the apostles, when Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin, Acts chapter 4? Do you know when they were brought before the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin accused them of what? The Sanhedrin accused them of being who? Unlearned and uneducated men. What do you think that means? Sometimes we walk away and we think that means, well, these guys were just dumb as posts right? They just walked up out of the turnip patch and they just rolled into Jerusalem and they just started spewing off things that didn't make any sense and they were just nincompoops. They just wandered in. They were just uneducated, unlearned. That's not what this means. Peter and John were very well educated. Peter and John are individuals who when you read through the balance in the New Testament write these profound and prophetic words. They were incredibly well educated. You see, the thing, the problem that the Sanhedrin had with the words that Peter and John spoke was that the words Peter and John spoke went primarily and concisely against what they believed. The words that you and I speak, if it sounds more like the world then it does like the Word. The world doesn't have a problem with us. We, in effect, are unlearned and uneducated. If what we say is from the Word and not the world, what an idiot. They have nothing figured out. And yet the world has some influence for us. The social media platform of Facebook tells you and it tells me that there are at least, what, 58 to 71 separate genders. You register for a Facebook account, you can choose from any number of genders. The number early was 58. The number today is 71. 
The world around you will tell you that there needs to be an understanding of a kind of lifestyle that is simply to be accepted because it is the way that it is. You see it shaped through the language that we find today in our world. A New England college, Amherst College, published a paper. And in the paper, they were offering feminine hygiene products for students on the campus. But in the language of the paper, they offer this, this, this free offering of feminine hygiene products are for students who menstruate. Thus, if you are a biologically born male and you come in to the student aid services office and you are seeking feminine products, although you are a biologically born male, but you identify with the sexual identity of a female, you therefore are entitled to receive feminine products of which you are biologically incapable of using. But lest we be offensive, we must offer them. I I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just not. How did we get to this place? How do we get to the place where it is offensive to not offer someone a feminine hygiene product that has no ability for which and by which to ever use it? But it's the place we've arrived. You see it in the use of restrooms present in public around us today. You see it not only in the notion of homosexual relationships or lesbian relationships, but you see it in the notion of polyamorous relationships or even in polygamous relationships. Polyamorous meaning any kind of variety of sexual desire. Polygamous meaning any number of marriages that you desire in one. So think for all of this, it has come to us as a profound issue and concern. In the beginning, God created male and female. This is the nature of God's creation. And it has been that way since the beginning of time. It is the means by which God has sustained all the world. There was a book written entitled The Overhauling of Straight America. They proposed seven separate tenets for individuals to be promoted in order to soften the public view of how we receive, talk about, and deal with sexual issues. Suggestion number one, talk openly and loudly about gayness. Think about it in your lifetime. If you're in your 30s, if you're in your 40s, if you're in your 50s, if you're in your 60s, think about it in terms of how you've seen the media promote and speak of. Back in like the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, the lifestyle of homosexuality was viewed as something that was just, just a little on the fringe of society and not really something that was spoken of too openly, but we knew it was out there. And if ever it were depicted in, in media, it was always depicted in a very light-hearted way. Thus, they were following the concept, depict homosexuals as victims and not aggressive challengers. Depict them of those, as, as those who have been put out upon by the world around them, those who have been harsh, harsh in their treatment and in their, in their cruelty. Step number three, advocate for anti-discrimination laws and civil protection. Make it a crime to say you cannot behave or live in this way or you cannot do these things or, or possess these things. Advocate for anti-discrimination laws. I'm not suggesting that discrimination laws need to exist. If you stop and think about it, discrimination laws, anti-discrimination laws already exist. But I'm wanting this to be a classified segment of a population if I'm in that community. And so now I have a special protection under the auspices of this. Number four, image control. Go back to those 70s, 80s, and 90s. If anyone was ever depicted as a homosexual or if anyone was ever depicted as living a lesbian lifestyle in any kind of popular media of the day, they were always the individual that dressed well. They were always the individual that came on the sitcom and they got the big laugh line. They were always the individual that was everybody's friend. And so there was this softening of the image so as to say, yeah, I may not choose that, but nothing wrong with it. Step number five, give opponents absolute vilification. Look, one of the worst things that you can be right now in, in, in the world, in America particularly, is labeled as someone who's homophobic. It's, it's absolutely reprehensible as far as the world is concerned. I'm not advocating that you be that. I'm just telling you that that is the label that's been levied. 
I would rather us be Christians who know how to speak with grace and salt to a world that has gone absolutely chaotic and know how to be engaging in that regard as opposed to just be categorized or to be labeled as someone who just hates a certain population. Step number six, raise money. Don't think for a moment that this is not at the heart of some of the issues. Do you remember why the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down? Do you remember why the legalization of homosexuality came into play back in 2014? Do you remember why? It was all predicated upon a tax issue that was brought up and raised before the United States Supreme Court. Who's entitled to this money and that money? Don't forget, the love of money is still a root to all kinds of evil. Step number seven, just make it happen. And oh, by the way, that book was written in 1987. How much do you think has been brought about? You know, the Bible has a lot to say about the nature of humanity. The Bible says that from the beginning there have been certain things that have been put in order. Remember what God tells Noah after the days of the flood? So long, so long as the earth remains, what? The sun, the moon, seed time, and harvest, the seasons, all of these constants of creation will remain. The same is true for the constants of the nature of who we are. So if we don't like the concept of this being a media issue and something being just absolutely thrown and thrust upon us from the media at large, now we bring in science to the equation. And some individuals will come along and say, all right, preacher, I get it, but people can't help this. They're born that way. You can't help it. You're you're born that way. Now, we don't buy the argument if we claim that someone is born a serial adulterer. We don't buy that argument. We don't buy that argument if we claim that someone is born a serial murderer. We don't buy that argument. We don't buy that argument if we claim that someone is born a serial polygamist. We don't buy that argument. We don't buy the argument when we claim that someone is born a serial pedophile. We don't don't buy that argument. But when it comes to sexuality and homosexuality and lesbian behavior, we'll step back and we'll say, yeah, but, I mean... You're born that way. Well, let's think about that. April 14th, 2003. Anybody remember where you were April 14th, 2003? Good, me either. Let's go on. So, April 14th, 2003, the Human Genome Project was announced to be fully completed. In fact, the Human Genome Project overseers came out and announced, Geneva, Switzerland, we have thoroughly mapped the human genome, it is complete. There is nothing more to be done or to be mapped. It is finished. Guess what gene was not discovered in the mapping of the Human Genome Project? Go ahead, guess. Any genetic code marking any absolute dependency upon any form of sexuality having to be same-sex related. It does not exist. The media will tell you not only that this did not occur, but the media will tell you and continue to tell you that because of not genetics, but epigenetics, epi is a Greek word that means over or on top of, because of epigenetics, the environment around us shapes these things, and thus there could arguably be some type of notion that says there is some type of reasonable nature that you are born with homosexual tendencies. And even yet, that is not fully true in its statement. You go further, away from 2003, you look to a more modern day time, 2016, 2018. There was a published article, the Atlanta, uh, the New Atlantis, published from individuals from John Hopkins University. So note that, John Hopkins University 
We're not talking about a study that was published from Fried Hardeman. We're not talking about a study that was published from Oklahoma Christian or Harding University or Faulkner. We're not talking about a study that was published by any major religious group. We're talking about a study that was published by John Hopkins University relative to sexuality and gender. Here were their findings. Let me, let me just walk you through a few. Number one, the understanding of sexual orientation as an innate, biologically fixed property of human beings, the idea that people are born that way is not supported by scientific evidence. Observation number two from the article. While there is evidence that biological factors such as genes and hormones associated with sexual behaviors and attractions, there are no compelling causal biological explanations for human sexual orientation. In other words, there are things that manifest themselves in your body that reflect your sexuality, but there are things that are not in your body that make or force your sexuality. Observation number three. Compared to the general population, non-heterosexual subpopulations are at an elevated risk for a variety of adverse health and mental health outcomes, including anxiety and depression. You think about it, in the terms of a community that deals with sexuality and sexual orientation struggles, you think about how they suffer. Observation number four, compared to heterosexuals, non-heterosexuals are about two to three times as likely to have experienced childhood abuse. There are traumas in all of our lives. There are big T traumas and little T traumas. I'm not minimizing the little T traumas. I am not inflating the big T traumas. What I'm telling you is that when you see something emerge by way of someone's sexuality that seems to be out of step with what Scripture has revealed ought to be in line with sexuality, there is some type of manifestation of some type of trauma somewhere along the line likely that has brought them to this place. And thus there's more going on in the individual's life other than just us saying, well, that guy likes guys and that girl likes girls. There's something more taking place there. Observation number five, members of the transgendered population are also at a higher risk of a variety of mental health problems compared to members of the non-transgendered population. The rate of lifetime suicide attempts across all ages of transgendered individuals is estimated at 41% compared to under 5% of the total overall U.S. population. Meaning? If I'm a male and I identify sexually as a female, I also fall into a category of being 41% more likely to want to take my own life. Why? Because even when I identify this way, I still don't feel like I belong anywhere. This is the profundity of this issue. This is a community that is desperately, desperately lonely. If, hear me, if all they hear from a Christian community is how they are on a fast track for condemnation, they'll quickly stop listening to us. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There's not one of us in this room that believes Jesus Christ sat on the sideline, looked at people's sin, and ignored it and excused it and said, just come on over, you're good. There's not a one of us that believes that. But at the same time, there's not one of us who can justifiably make an argument that Jesus was glad to look upon people's sin and say, I can't wait for you to get yours. Somehow we must write the same balance in our life. He is grace. He is truth. And it must be reflected in us. According to a recent estimate, about 6%, excuse me, 0.6% of U.S. adults identify as a gender that does not correspond to their biological sex. Now stop and think about this. If this is not a power play among the people of a world, particularly of a nation, I don't know what is. You write laws, you enact statements, you adopt policies, you force issues and force standards for how much of the population? Less than 1%. Barely half a percent are among this community. 
they need grace? Yes, they need grace. But they're also being used. They're being used. God have mercy on the people who use other people. You don't believe me? Read the book of Amos. God doesn't like it when people are oppressed for any reason. God doesn't like it when people are exploited for any reason. God frowns upon it. Don't do it. Think about this. One study found that compared to controls, sex reassigned individuals were about five times more likely to attempt suicide and about 19 times more likely to die by suicide. Nearly all individuals who go through a surgical reassignment of sexual identity report later at some point in the future that they desired not to do this. They would undo it if op option allowed because they're exponentially more likely to die by suicide. What does the Bible have to say about any of this? I want to share these things with you because it is so real. Moms and dads say, what do I tell my sons and daughters? What do I tell my sons and daughters who have gay friends? Or what do I tell my son who struggles with sexual identity? Or what do I tell my daughter who struggles with sexual identity? What do I say to them about all of these things? I presented much of this material a couple of years ago to a group of about 3,000 young people at a conference, at a, at a seminar, an event in, in Alabama. And I put... I put a, a website up where they could send me in questions, and, and there were literally hundreds of questions. I, I couldn't answer all of the questions in that moment. But then there were people that were coming up afterwards to ask personal, individual questions. One young girl came up and said, I, I, still, I still don't understand why is it a sin? Why is it a sin? Here's, here's what I said to her. God's call to you, to me, to anyone is not that I stop desiring someone sexually of the same sex and start desiring someone sexually of the opposite sex. God's call to you and God's call to me is that I recognize there is a divine image to which He's calling all of us. If that means I do not indulge myself sexually, if that means I do not indulge myself personally, if that means I do not indulge myself individually, it's because I've recognized there is a greater divine image to which I'm being called. My goal as a, as a husband, as a father, as a preacher, is not to put down same-sex relationships and exalt only heterosexual relationships, but rather is to exalt Christ is the only relationship that makes any difference. And if He, did you hear His words? If He is lifted up, all men will be drawn to Him, not to justify why they want what they want, but to surrender to Him everything that they thought they ever wanted that pales in comparison to him. 2 Peter 3, 1 rather, verses 3 through 4. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him so that you might become divine partakers having escaped the corruption that is in the world. Through what? Through lust. It's the knowledge of him. Here's this concept. If I know Christ and I am consumed with Christ, and I am desiring Christ, and I am seeking Christ, and I want Christ, then the things of this world will fall by the wayside. There is this concept that cannot be denied. Out of the concept, you see a consideration. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. I want you to think about something. This is not being flippant, nor is this making a stretch of a point. I want you to think about something. Gender identity has always mattered to God. And here in our world today, there is a greater political narrative to undermine, to deface, and to negate the place of men in roles of power, authority, leadership, guidance, 
or direction. One of the worst things you can be today in this world is a masculine man who wants to lead others in good, godly, right directions. Amen, somebody. We went from John Wayne to skinny jeans overnight, and I don't know how it happened. It's absolutely ridiculous. Stop caving in to the narratives of the world. Lead your families. Men, stop trying to look like a softened image so the world will embrace you. Men, step out from among the shadows wherein the world has relegated you and be leaders for your families. There's a consideration. Be who God called you to be. There is a crisis. There's a crisis of personal value. We don't feel accepted. We don't feel wanted. We don't feel like we belong. We don't feel necessary. And we scratch our heads and we wonder, how did a generation grow up believing that they don't feel accepted, they don't feel needed, they don't feel wanted? We scratch our heads and wonder, how did anyone ever arrive at this place? Many of us have attributed the ills of social media, the advent of smart devices, personal cell phones that allow us to be connected to the world around since 2007. And while there is correlating evidence that says anxiety and depression have skyrocketed since 2007, let me tell you, since the 1970s, we have slaughtered the unborn in this country. And it is no shock for any of us that a generation upon a generation upon a generation should rise up and give consideration to the idea and the notion that their life doesn't matter. Nobody wants me. Why should I be here? Let me seek out something so I won't feel this way. Whatever that something is, be it the sexual gratification of someone of the same gender in order to escape the loneliness that you feel. The sexual identity is symptomology of a greater problem. It is a crisis of loneliness. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. If we don't start telling people the value of their lives, they'll never know there's something greater for them than just what they can fulfill on their own wants and desires. There's a compassion. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. They were scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. What do you see when you see individuals of that community? What do you see? Who do you see? Do you see contempt poured out? or compassion. Here's a conviction. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, even homosexuality. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Maybe the way of escape for individuals to lift up their eyes away from their own calamity and see the cross. The Bible says that your life is hidden with Christ in God. The true identity for all of us is not to be identified as a murderer or a liar or a thief or an adulterer or a homosexual or a sodomite or a lesbian or a transgendered or a gay or a queer, or a questioning. Our identity is in Christ. And all of these divisions and subdivisions and subdivisions of the subdivisions fall by the wayside. And we lift up our eyes and see Him. We find that we are complete in Him. Years of preaching, we preach about these issues more than once. So years ago, I preached about these issues. And a man came afterwards and he said, you really didn't expect anyone to respond to the invitation this morning, did you?
You always hope they do. He went on to say how terrible that would have been to see someone come like that. I said, perhaps you should consider responding next time. And no, no one did respond that day, as a matter of fact. But that week, a family called. May we talk? Two weeks later, a father called. I need to tell some things to someone. And other people began to respond. Know that your shepherds love you here or else they would not put these things in front of you for you to think about. Know that they believe that Jesus Christ is the answer here or else He would not be lifted up. Know that His invitation is open to you here and hereafter. Believe that He's the Christ. Believe that your identity is in Him. You're made new, whole, clean in Him through His blood and through His water. Resurrected with Him. Wherever you are, be in Him. If you need to respond to the gospel call, won't you come as we stand and sing?